so yeah, thanks very much for that introduction, Justin. And this is my talk about uh, the internal architecture of mocking in RSpec. And as already mentioned, I'm Sam Fippin. Uh, I'm Sam Fippin on Twitter and GitHub if you like playing social media games. And sort of, as mentioned uh, on GitHub, I spend most of my time uh, committing as a member of the RSpec core team, fixing bugs, uh, adding new features, that sort of thing. And I also work for a company called Fun and Plausible Solutions. And we're sort of a consulting agency for hard computer science problems. And so what my typical day looks like is we end up working with client teams that like are people like you who know how to build amazing web or mobile applications. But then they run up against some kind of hard computer science problem, like a machine learning or recommender system problem or computer vision or something like that. And then we come in to either do training or internal software build and that sort of thing. And if any of that sounds at all interesting to you, please do come and have a chat with me after the talk. I wanted to sort of prefix this talk by saying a big, wonderful hello to everyone in the audience. It's my first time here in Lyon. I've got lots of people waving at me. And I have to say, so far, it's been a really interesting time, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of my time here. Um, so I wanted to start by sort of uh, positing the question, why? is testing. Why is it that we actually write tests for our applications? And to me, I think one of the most important reasons that I write tests is that when I'm developing a piece of software, I have this internal mental model of what's going on. And quite frankly, the way I think about my software tends to be a lot more perfect than it actually is. And I suspect a number of you also maintain these perfect sort of platonic ideal models in your head whilst you're writing your software. And the problem with that is that as you sort of make changes and add features, squash bugs or refactor, your software begins to get out of shape. It begins to change and suddenly the way that you think about your software and the way it behaves doesn't match up with reality anymore. And that can be really problematic. And one thing that I sort of distilled from my own TDD practice is this idea that when I write tests, they're literally forcing behavior on the piece of software that I'm writing. That is, if I have an automated test suite, I have a thing that forces my application to behave in a certain way. And I think that that's really valuable because the sort of inverse of that statement is that when you don't have tests, when you've written no tests whatsoever. You have no automated way of proving any behavior on your application. And thusly, it could be argued that literally anything could happen when any piece of your code run, runs. And that's a really bad property to have. You really don't want your software to be able to do anything. You want it to do the specific thing you're building it for. And I think that's one real great benefit that tests provide you. The other thing I wanted to say is there's sort of been some questions around whether we should write isolated unit testing in the Ruby community recently. And for me, I find that it helps me design my objects a lot better and prove that they actually work how I'm intending to. And so I would definitely say that unit testing makes me really happy. And one thing that I think is quite important when you're writing isolated unit tests are stubs and mocks, which are sort of complementary tools to existing software to allow you to isolate the objects that you're testing in a way that allows you to reason about the behavior much more simply. So let's just go through what these terms actually mean. So stubbing is a way of isolating your objects in test from their collaborators by replacing implementations of specific methods with faked out responses. And so when you're unit testing an object, it's really a good idea to, at the very least, stub all of the collaborations that are going to happen uh, between that object and all of its collaborators. And the way that you create a stub with the RSpec syntax, for those of you that may use other testing frameworks, is you say, allow x to receive foo and return 3. And from that point on, anywhere in the rest of your test, when you invoke x.foo, it will always return 3. And so what you've done here is you've replaced whatever the implementation of x.foo is. Maybe it touches a database or goes out to a HTTP API and counts things with a much, much simpler implementation that's very easy to reason about. And once that's happened, you can sort of begin to reason more easily about the code that's actually inside your object itself. Mocking 
is a complement to stubbing, which allows you to test that collaborations are actually happening. It's testing that methods are actually going to get called by an object when you sort of run whatever method that you happen to be testing. And the way that you express this in RSpec land is that you say something like, expect x to receive foo. And then that will set up a mock on x for the method foo that will cause the test to fail if x doesn't receive the foo method somewhere throughout its entire duration. And the way this works is it sort of actually checks calls rather than doing any kind of crazy call graph inspection, that sort of thing. So it actually just checks to see if the method gets run. Um, and you can also set up more complex expectations. So for example, if we want to verify an argument, we can say expect x to receive foo with three. And that will cause the test to fail if x.foo is invoked with any argument other than three on its own. You can also specify uh, receive counts. So for example, if I know that I want my implementation to call x.foo exactly four times, I can add this final line on the bottom of this test here. But this talk really isn't about how you should actually go about mocking and stubbing as such, but rather asking the question, how do these things actually work? And the steps I'm going to go through today are specific to RSpec. I don't have much of a view of the internals of many other mocking libraries, so I don't know how much this sort of will cross-pollinate. But with that disclaimer, let's dive in. So stubs are our sort of more simple form of method replacement, right? They're not actually testing that anything happens. And so let's imagine that we've written this test here. So it does something, allow foo to receive bar, and then expect foo.bar to ek nil. And this test should pass, right? Because we've not specified a return value, our spec will choose the simplest possible return value, which is nil. And so foo.bar will always return nil. And then on the second line, we just expect that to be true. And then the test finishes. The parts I've highlighted here are the parts that are most important to the mechanics of actually running this test. So the allow foo and the receive bar are the parts that I think are most interesting to working out how this actually works. And so let's have a look at what allow actually does. So in RSpec, many of the methods that are available to you inside your tests are simply convenience wrappers around constructing some internal RSpec object. And allow is one of those methods. So it's just RSpec syntax sugar for creating an object called an allowance target. And so what allow basically is, is it delegates straight through to allowance target on new. And this is the first of our sort of objects that's required to successfully stub a method. And so we have this allowance target. And the allowance target is a subclass of a class called target base. And what target base is, is it's basically a series of convenience methods for doing things like mocking and stubbing and more complicated uh, message replacement oper operations that you can do inside RSpec. And when the allowance target class is being defined, it calls a method called delegate2 on target base with this uh, argument setup allowance. And uh, you should watch the setup allowance as it threads through the next series of slides, because that's uh, one of the more important things. And what the job of delegate2 basically is, is to define the actual2 method on the target object itself. So where you see allow foo2, that2 method actually isn't on the allowance target. It's defined dynamically by the target base class. And so we have this call that goes out from the allowance target to the target base. And then the target base object actually dynamically defines the two method on the allowance target. And this is done because the two method has a number of sort of common error checks that exist between all of the uh, mocking and stubbing calls in RSpec. But then the setup allowance argument that I mentioned earlier is defined so that two will call setup allowance on any arguments passed into the two method. And in RSpec sort of parlance, the arguments that you pass into the two method are called matches. So things like ek and b and so on are all matches. Uh, receive is another one. And so this is what our call graph looks like at this point. Allowance target has called out to target base, and then the call comes back through up to allowance target to define that method. And at that point, we're actually done with the entire allow and to expressions 
And now we need to look at the receive part of this. So receive, like allow, is basically an RSpec convenience function that delegates straight to receive.new to create a new receive matcher object. And so all the things uh, in RSpec, whatever you're passing into that to method, uh, is called a matcher. And that goes both for mocking and the state-based expectations that exist in the RSpec expectations framework. And receive is our sort of most commonly used uh, mocking and stubbing matcher. It's the one that I certainly see most often when people hop into the IRC channel and ask for help. And so what the allowance target to method will now do with that past receive matcher is it will call setup allowance on the past matcher. And from that point onwards, the receive matcher does all of the sort of heavy lifting to actually set up the mock expectation. And so the call graph now looks like this, and the receive matcher is going to do the rest of our work. And the first thing that the receive matcher does when it receives this call to set up allowance is it creates what's called a mock proxy for the object that is going to have the stub placed on it. And it's the job of the mock proxy to manage all the sort of metadata around stubs and mocks for any individual object within the life cycle of a test. And so what will then happen is the mock proxy will have this add stub method invoked on it, which basically tells the proxy that it's time to set up the stub. And so our call graph now looks like this, and we've gone down from the receive matcher into the mock proxy. And as I mentioned, it's the job of the mock proxy to manage all of the mocks and stubs for an individual object. And the reason we do this is that you could place that data on the object itself. But I think it's much cleaner to have a companion object, and that's sort of what the proxy does. It's also the case that if we were to write a test like this, where we have allow foo to receive bar and allow foo to receive baz, we'll only ever create one mock proxy for that foo object, despite the fact that we're creating two expectations. And so for each object and for each test, there will only ever be one mock proxy object. And then the mock proxy goes ahead and creates an object that's called a method double for the stubbed method. And what the method double is basically responsible for is managing the stubbed implementation and the original implementation of the method. So it sort of swaps them out and swaps them back at the end of your test. And so at that point, our call graph looks like this, and we're basically done. The method double is going to uh, finish setting up the expectation, and then we're done. And so the method double, basically, when it's created, saves the original implementation of the method. So in this case, we are stubbing on foo.bar. And so what the method double will do is it will very specifically create, take the current foo.bar method and save it inside itself. Uh, then it will place the stubbed implementation onto the object and allow the test to continue to run. And so it's actually the method double itself which creates our stubbed implementation. And once it's done doing that, uh, we've actually done with that first line of the test. We've done all the stubbing and mocking that is necessary to actually deal with that first line of the test. But we're going to make a call to our, our stubbed method on the next line. And so we need to actually look at how the calls occur when you invoke a stubbed method. And so foo.bar is our sort of stubbed implementation uh, of the original method that we've created. And what actually happens is it's not as simple as just calling that stub and then gathering the return value. Our spec needs to update a bunch of internal state when that happens. And so when you call foo.bar, it actually sends a callback to the method double so that the method double can do things like check call counts and ensure that the correct method has been called, and so on. And then that gets threaded back through to the mock proxy. And the actual sort of stubbed implementation, whether that be a block or a simple return value or something to check arguments or receive counts, uh, will actually get invoked there. And that's known as the stubbed implementation. And that's stored inside the mock proxy. And so the mock proxy invokes our stub. And then that generates our return value which is given to the user. And at that point, we've sort of finished this test. We've executed both of the lines. But we still have to do some cleanup after the test is done, because our spec sort of manages the life cycle of stubs and mocks, as you wouldn't really want to have a stub on an object, and then your test finishes, and then that stub is still there. Because if you were to continue to pass that around, there would be all kinds of weird side effects, and it wouldn't be at all obvious why uh, that stub was still there, and maybe that would cause interesting or weird bugs. And so 
the RSpec testing lifecycle uh, looks something like this. So before your test, a method called RSpec mocks setup is invoked, which, is, uh, which creates an object called a mock space, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then your test runs. And then we run these two steps called RSpec mocks verify and RSpec mocks teardown. And it's teardown that we'll be focusing on in this stubbing case. So all of these calls happen inside what's called a mock space, which is created in the RSpec mocks setup step. And so what this does is it ends up sort of wrapping all of the objects that are created throughout the sort of stub call flow that you would expect. And then at the end of your test in the RSpec mocks teardown phase, reset all is invoked on the current mocking space, uh, which calls reset on each proxy, which calls reset on each method double. And the job of the method double at this point is to return the original implementation that you stubbed back to the objects. And once sort of all of the proxies and all of the method doubles have been reset, it should always be the case that your objects were in the original state that they were when you started stubbing and mocking them. And so at that point, the life cycle of this test is over, and we've actually covered everything that we need to talk about for this first test. But I did also tell you that I was going to talk to you about mocks. And so uh, we're going to go through this cycle one more time, um, but this time with a mock instead of a stub. And so let's imagine we have this test. And it says, expect foo to receive bar with three. And then the next line is expect foo.bar of three to equal nil. And again, this should work because we haven't specified a return value. And we're calling the, in this case, a mock with the correct argument. And as you might expect, given that allow is syntax sugar for allowance target dot new, expect is just syntax sugar for expectation target dot new. And the rest of the call graph looks more or less exactly the same. So the only thing that's changed here is that the expectation target has been dropped in instead of the allowance target. And this is where the sort of power of the target base object comes into play, because uh, the expectation target asks to have its two methods set up to call setup expectation instead of setup allowance. And that's really the only difference in that left-hand side of the call graph. Uh, we pass in a receive matcher again to the two method. And it's worth sort of just noting here as we're going along that because we're calling receive bar with three, um, it's actually the receive matcher that's going to store all of the details of the stubbed and mocked implementation that, that you're creating. So uh, in this case, we're, the part of our implementation that we're interested in is that it's a method that takes one argument, and that argument has to be three. Well, you can also call and return, or exactly some number of times, right? And every time you do that, you're basically dot chaining on the receive matcher object itself. And so what's happening is you're building up all of this state inside this object to be defined into a mocked method later. And so we go back down through this call graph. And when we actually invoke foo.bar again, we get these same series of callbacks through the method double and the proxy. But when the proxy callback is invoked this time, we have a different implementation, which is a mock that's also going to be checking its arguments. And so what will happen is that the proxy callback will actually check that the arguments that were passed to the method are correct. And if those methods aren't correct, the proxy uh, will raise an exception if those arguments don't match. And this is one thing that I think is really cool uh, and done correctly in sort of Ruby testing frameworks, is the way that test failures are reported is by raising expectations. And that's the same throughout Minitest and all the other testing frameworks that you might find. And one thing that that's really great is that means they're interoperable. So you can load RSpec mocks into Minitest if you want to, or you can load Minitest's testing into uh, RSpec if you want to. And they'll all work with each other, because all they do to report failures is they raise expectation, uh, exceptions. And that's how these sort of failures are reported. At the end of our test, we go through the same sort of uh, teardown step that we had before, except that this time we're going through RSpec mocks verify. And the reason that we're doing that is that we created a mock expectation instead of a simple stub. And so what happens is space verify all delegates through to verify on each proxy. And the proxy will check how many times each method that it was expecting was invoked. And if uh, the number of times isn't correct, it will raise an exception if say, the mock wasn't called. And so that will also cause your test to fail at the end of its life cycle. And so that 
is an exploration of how all of the RSpec mock and stubbing things work. So just to quickly recap, your test lives inside a life cycle where RSpec mocks will both set up and tear down all of the mocks that you create for you so that your state is exactly the same before your test as it is after your test. It will also verify uh, that mock expectations happen after your test is done because that's the only sensible way to actually check that calls between collaborators happen. Um, expect and allow are convenience methods that create target objects that allow you to sort of wrap whichever particular object it is you're stubbing or mocking on in a way that makes sense. When they do that, they call out to this class called target base, which will define the to method for them. And so we end up with a call graph that looks like this between our target and target base object. The receive matcher in both of these cases uh, will store the implementation of whichever stub or mock you're trying to create, including argument checking, return values, and expected call counts. Those will then get verified later in the test, depending on what's going on. The receive object uh, is designed to create what's called a mock proxy for the object that you're stubbing on. And it's the job of the mock proxy to manage all of the stubs and mocks for any individual object in the lifecycle of your test. For each method that you stub or mock, a method double object will get created, whose job it is to sort of hold and swap out stubbed implementations with real implementations. And then finally, our call cool graph looks all like this when we're creating either a stub or a mock. When that method gets invoked, you get a sort of callback chain that looks like this, where you call whichever stubbed method it is, which calls back through the method double and the proxy. The proxy then invokes whatever stubbed implementation you're dealing with to generate the return value and passes that back to the user. All of these objects get lifecycled inside what's called a mock space. And it's the job of the mock space to basically manage uh, receive matches, proxies, method doubles, and targets in such a way that when the space gets sort of garbage collected at the end of your test, not Ruby garbage collection, but sort of RSpec collection, uh, the state of the world is cleaned up once it's gone. And with that, we're sort of done. Um, RSpec 3 was released really recently. Um, I totally suggest you use it. It's much more consistent. It has new features. I th really think it's a lot better than RSpec 2. And there's tools to help you automatically upgrade between RSpec 2 and RSpec 3, which we can talk about later if you're interested. Um, my slides are available on the internet already at tinyurl.com slash samrl2014, and you can just you know, copy that down if you're interested. Um, and with that, I'm basically done. Uh, I'm Sam Fippin on Twitter and GitHub. You can email me at sam at funandplausible.com if you want to chat further, tweet me questions, come chat with me afterwards, and that is the end of my talk.